Hi, I'm Jim Hugh, Professor of Urologic Oncology, and I'd like to discuss elevated PSA and how that may be worked up. In terms of prostate cancer epidemiology, uh, in 2017, there's an estimated 161,000 new cases. Uh, the lifetime risk of U.S. men in the diagnosis of prostate cancer is 1 in 7. There's approximately 26,730 deaths due to prostate cancer in 2017, and approximately 2.8 million men in the United States who are living with prostate cancer. So this is a relatively common condition. When we look at the lessons learned of using historical data, and this comes from our National Cancer Institute Tumor Registry, we can see that with the widespread implementation of PSA screening, which is a blood test, that the likelihood of being diagnosed with metastatic disease uh, went down dramatically. And this was introduced in the early 1990s, and you can see that the incidence of metastasis at diagnosis plummeted from 70 per, over 70 per 100,000 men to approximately 30 per 100,000 men and subsequently to about 25 per 100,000 men. In contrast, in women, with the imp implementation of widespread mammography, you can see that the incidence of metastasis to diagnosis really didn't change. And one, one reason for this is the heterogeneity in the behavior of cancers. And so you can see using this diagram, that screening represented on the, by the red line here is to detect cancer. And there's fast-moving cancers represented by the hummingbird. There's non-progressive cancers represented by the snail, which may just be an abnormal appearance of cells under the microscope. And then there's cancers that produce more slowly. And so the theory is that breast cancers may act more like these fast-moving cancers, and therefore at the time of diagnosis, there may already be metastasis whereas there's an opportunity with prostate cancers in general to detect them before they've metastasized. Now the risk, of course, is that there's also overdiagnosis if these tumors look abnormal under the microscope, but uh, grow very slowly, if at all. When we look at the consequences of the recommendation against PSA screening that came out in 2008 by the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, uh, in men aged over 75 and in all men regardless of age in 2012, we can see that the number of men uh, undergoing prostate needle biopsies went down dramatically by approximately 29%, and actually treatment with surgery, which is the most common treatment option for prostate cancer, decreased by about 16%, uh, comparing before versus after 2012. In terms of uh, active surveillance, prostate biopsies, uh, those actually went up by approximately 30%. This was also corroborated by uh, investigators at the University of Michigan. Uh, they also demonstrated that looking at uh, the, the decrease in, in curative prostate cancer treatments here, also including radiation, that the rates of treatments went down 42% in uh, men who are aged at risk for prostate cancer. And then in terms of men who are diagnosed with prostate cancer, the likelihood of treatment only went down 8%, however, was still significant. Uh, around the time the task force recommended against PSA screening. Now, consequently, we've seen a shift. I showed you earlier how PSA testing was accompanied by a decrease in the incidence of metastatic disease at the time of diagnosis. And again, remember that in 2008, now approximately nine years ago, the task force recommended against screening in older men, those older than 75 years, and we can see that in contrast to the decline seen in the early 1990s, we've actually seen a, a, a decrease in, down to the lowest point in 2011, and then an upswing in the likelihood of metastatic disease at diagnosis in men aged over 75 years. Now, this is, is a tweet that was actually comes from the National Cancer Institute and uh, really trying to address the public awareness of whether or not PSA testing should be done. And I, I like this tweet because it's individualized, it shows very nicely uh, in, in terms of this uh, plot of the likelihood of being diagnosed with prostate cancer, the likelihood of getting a false positive, meaning that if one has an elevation in the PSA, uh, a prostate needle biopsy certainly has about a 3% risk of a serious infection. Uh, there's about a 1% risk that one may have difficulty urinating afterwards and needs to go to the emergency room. There's a bleeding that's almost always self-resolving in terms of blood in the urine, which lasts about seven to eight days. Uh, spotting of blood from the rectum that may last one to two days, and blood in the jacket that would last up to two months. However, I would, I would also point out that some of the risks mentioned here are somewhat overstated. 
meaning that one, th this representation shows that everyone who gets prostate cancer uh, implies that everyone would get treatment. And, and of those that get treated, it says here that at least 50% will have complications such as infections, sexual dysfunction, uh, bladder or bowel control problems, and whereas the likelihood of death from prostate cancer uh, is not that high. Uh, additionally, because prostate cancer tends to grow slowly, as I showed you earlier in that diagram, there may be a likelihood of dying from other causes, as these men may be elderly and have other uh, illnesses that would cause them death rather than prostate cancer. And so when we talk about an individualized uh, PSA screening paradigm, we're certainly moving away from screening every year or annual PSA testing to screening every few years. And I, I believe the best way to do this is to get a baseline PSA for a man in his 40s to establish the subsequent risk of diagnosing prostate cancer and death from prostate cancer, and then establishing future intervals for PSA te testing at, at, at least every three years, which is the interval that was used in the European randomized study for prostate cancer screening that demonstrated a mortality benefit associated with PSA testing. And so when we look at the evidence that came from the Harvard Physicians Health Study, this was just published last year, and this demonstrates that when you look at the men who died of prostate cancer in that study, and they had the ability to go back and look at blood that was banked uh, at age 40 to 49, at age 50 to 54, and at age 55 to 59, one can see that based on the percentile of where they were relative to the distribution of the other PSAs, that their risk of mortality was higher or they accounted for more of the prostate cancer deaths if their PSA, for instance, was in the top 10th percentile or the top quartile for age 40 to 49. This accounted for 55% of the lethal prostate cancers for men in that age group. Uh, and uh, for the top quartile, that accounted for over 82% of the lethal prostate cancers. And so in other words, if you were a man who got a PSA test in your 40, you're in your 40s and you found that your, your PSA is less than 0.7, which was the median in this study, then your lifetime risk of dying for prostate cancer is very low and or for diagnosing prostate cancer and therefore you may want to increase the interval of future PSA testing. Similarly, these norms are given for men aged 50 to 54, for men aged 55 to 59, and most importantly you can see that the median value increases with aging. And so that's another important thing to realize is that the old cutoff for PSA used to be an absolute cutoff of four, but now we adjust it based on age-specific PSA. And so one of the tests that you can get if you get a higher than age-specific PSA before you go on to biopsy now is a 4K test. This is a, a precision medicine test. It's a composite of four prostate-specific biomarkers, and it's resulted instead of a continuous variable like PSA in a fashion that individually stratifies your risk of having a clinically significant prostate cancer. And so this is an example of a 4K uh, test result and you can see that the way that it's resulted is a probability for the patient not having an aggressive disease on prostate biopsy. So in this particular case there's a 61 percent chance that this individual will not have an aggressive prostate cancer uh, if that patient went on to biopsy. Conversely, uh, there's a 39% chance that this patient will be found to have an aggressive prostate cancer. Now, what is the definition of, of, of aggressive prostate cancer? Here, it's a Gleason score of seven or higher if the biopsy is performed. On this test, uh, somewhat subjectively, they also stratify into low risk being less than 7.5%. Intermediate risk is from 7.5 to 20% and a high risk of finding aggressive prostate cancer is greater than 20%. And so again, another blood test, a 4K, may be drawn if the PSA is high and a man is trying to decide whether or not to pursue additional workup or biopsy. Now, another test that's become very popular recently is a prostate MRI. Uh, now, MRIs are, are becoming more and more ubiquitous or commonplace. Uh, there's a lot of centers now that are, are found uh, just uh, in the uh, public uh, on different streets and even at malls. And so, however, a critical aspect of these MRIs is that the experience of the center is critical. And what I mean by that is there's differing techniques in how prostate MRIs are performed. Uh, there's different magnet strengths. And also just as important 
is the experience of the MRI radiologist who's interpreting the prostate MRI. We're fortunate here at Wall Cornell to have one of the premier world authorities in looking at prostate MR, Dan Margulis, who actually also developed the PIRAD scoring for assessing the risk of prostate cancer, which is the grading system that goes from one to five. Men who have a PIRADS one uh, are highly unlikely to have uh, a, a clinically significant prostate cancer, again, the Gleason score seven or higher. Uh, PIRADS two are unlikely to have clinically significant prostate cancer. A PIRADS three is equivocal or, or indeterminate. PIRADS four is uh, that there is a likelihood that there is a clinically significant prostate cancer. And a PIRADS five, it's highly likely that there's clinically significant prostate cancer. So we tend to counsel men to consider biopsy if they have a PIRADS 3, 4, or 5, and avoid biopsy if they have a PIRADS 1 or 2. Now this study was just published uh, and comes from the United Kingdom and asked the question of how worthwhile is a MRI uh, in the setting of suspicion for prostate cancer, that is a PSA that was elevated up to 15 in this cohort, or an abnormal prostate exam. And, uh, basically looked at this in comparison to those who underwent a prostate biopsy. So the way that this study was designed was that everybody had an MRI in the setting of elevated PSA or abnormal prostate exam uh, before a biopsy, uh, and then they were able to compare uh, what the utility of the MRI was in this setting. And what they found was that 27% that of men who had uh, suspicion for prostate cancer may have been able to avoid a biopsy if they had had an MRI first. And so this is critical to avoid some of the discomfort associated uh, with uh, the, the, the biopsy technique. And I think we'll find and gives evidence, hopefully to insurers, to universally cover MRIs in the setting of elevated PSA. Now the drawback, of course, is that adds expense to the healthcare system. This is just the schematic of what the multi-parametric MRI uh, different phases of this that help the radiologist determine the risk of having prostate cancer. If there is an area that's suspicious, the radiologist will contour or draw circles around that area uh, defined by the yellow here in this diagram and by the blue in this diagram. This is just a representation of the Artemis biopsy device that we have to fuse an abnormal MRI to a real-time ultrasound image. Uh, the downside of doing a uh, in-bore or directly in, in the in the uh, facility of an MRI biopsy is that it tends to take longer. Uh, and number two is that you can't sample the other areas of prostate, uh, the prostate as easily. Whereas with the transrectal ultrasound, this is done in the urologist's office. Uh, the, uh, the ultrasound gives us real time information. And at the same time, by, by segmentation with the radiologist, we can fuse the MRI image onto the ultrasound so that we can target these areas that are abnormal captured by the, the blue there. And this just demonstrates, these schematics just demonstrate the individual needle track lines uh, to sample the prostate. And so in conclusion, the evidence is pointing to getting a baseline PSA for men to assess their future risk of de developing prostate cancer and death from prostate cancer. Uh, therefore, smarter PSA screening is movement away from just an annual PSA test uh, starting at age 40 or 50. Uh, therefore, if one, a man has an elevated PSA, one can consider getting biomarkers such as a 4K test. An MRI test is also uh, considered a biomar biomarker since it gives you a risk assessment for the likelihood of having clinically significant prostate cancer. And also by getting an MRI, we can then more accurately target the, uh, the, the lesion in question to determine whether it's prostate cancer or not. And finally, there's evidence that up to a quarter of men, if they had an MRI uh, done uh, due to suspicion of prostate cancer, that a quarter of these men may be able to avoid unnecessary biopsies. Thank you for your attention.